Welcome to Civil War Digital Digest. I'm Will. Well, this episode looks quite a bit different than you normally see Digest episodes. It looks more like a live stream, and we're going to say welcome to the man on the other side of the screen right now, Mr. Matt Borders. Matt, welcome back, and thanks for coming on the Digest. Well, it's a pleasure to be here as always. I've been looking forward to being back. Yep, and unfortunately Matt and I can't be together. We had planned to shoot right before Christmas and then two major things happened. First, we had the snowstorm that shut so much of the country down and second, I was COVID positive. So for safety, we canceled the shoot and we want to say today thanks to the CWDD Coffee Grinders. There are patrons on Patreon.com. A lot of people give just a little bit of money each and that adds up to cover many of the expenses of this endeavor, including the live streaming software that we're using to talk today. We also want to say thanks to our friends at History Fix. Although they're not officially sponsoring this episode, they've been really great in helping us connect with the folks over at Historical Films Group. You're going to see some great video that's going to help understand the story we're going to talk about today. It comes from the Fredericksburg documentary that Historical Films Group did, currently streaming only on History Fix. Hope you enjoy it here and go check it out over there. There's links below if, if you want to do that. Matt, we're going to go later into one of your books that's just out. Uh, we'll talk about that down the road, but today we're going to talk about one man in the book. Who are we talking about? We're going to be looking at Lieutenant Colonel Henry J. Baxter of the 7th Michigan Infantry. Now, the book is covering Fredericksburg, and I think uh, your fans and, and those who are familiar with the Battle of Fredericksburg have heard of the 7th Michigan. They've got a monument there right down by the Rappahannock River because they're involved with the crossing of the river. That desperate fight to get across the river and clear out Confederate sharpshooters from the actual edges of Fredericksburg itself. Talk to me about how Baxter gets into the Army and to Fredericksburg. He's a little bit of an older recruit. He has actually spent quite a bit of time doing other things in his life before the American Civil War. He's actually from New York originally. Uh, he's born in New York, and he's going to be born in 1821. So he's about 20 years older than most of your recruits during the American Civil War. And he moves to Michigan at age 10. Now in 1849, he's going to go to California. Uh, it tries to be a 49er. And he would return to Jonesville in 1852 and is a milliner. So he's going to be working milling operations, all that good stuff. Um, he is going to become involved with the militia system in Michigan. He would be the captain of the Jonesville Light Guard there in Jonesville. And he is going to have the Jonesville Light Guard become Company C of the 7th Michigan Infantry when it is raised, or when it musters in, I should say, on August 22nd, 1861. Now, Henry's going to go in as a captain. He's 39 years old at the time. And he is going to be present throughout most of the early career of the 7th Michigan Infantry. Uh, he is going to be wounded and uh, as we said, on July 1st, 1862, he's going to be made lieutenant colonel during this period as well, and then wounded again at Antietam later that fall. So he's going to have two pretty quick wounds, one in July, one in September. He recuperates from that second wound in particular there at Antietam and apparently is removed from command, <laughs> and but is back at Fredericksburg to command the 7th, where he is wounded for his third time in action there. Let me stop you for a second. You've said that Baxter was serving while officially dismissed when he's wounded at Fredericksburg. How long does it take for the Army to figure out his mistake and get him reinstated? What's going to happen is, is that he had actually put in for a leave of absence uh, shortly after the Battle of Antietam on September 20th, and he would receive a 20-day furlough to rest and recuperate from his abrasion. He gets to go home for a little bit. Um, but he is going to be officially dismissed from service by the President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, on December 5th, 1862. Now, we don't know, but I personally don't believe that Baxter ever was notified that he'd been dismissed because we don't see anything about that in the records about him uh, questioning it. We don't hear about it in the official records of the War of the Rebellion that um, he's has concerns. So I believe he just returned 
from his furlough, he is going to continue to work with and lead the 7th Michigan Infantry throughout December through the Battle of Fredericksburg. And then on January 5th, 1863, Special Orders Number 5 is released by the War Department stating that he is back in command. Okay, that his his suspension and removal from command has been revoked. Okay, so Matt, during the Civil War, Lieutenant Colonel, we may think second in command of a regiment, but wartime necessity changes things. What role is Baxter playing with the 7th at the Battle of Fredericksburg? Baxter will actually be commanding the regiment, the 7th Michigan Infantry, at Fredericksburg, and he will be the man who takes that regiment across the Rappahannock River and begins to clear out those buildings on the opposite side. Now, he is going to be wounded in the process of doing this and is, in fact, referred to in the after-action report of his division commander, Brigadier General Oliver Howard, as the gallant Lieutenant Colonel Baxter. But unfortunately, he's not going to be commanding the 7th Michigan for the entirety of the fight because he is wounded fairly early on. Well, okay, you mentioned the 7th in the fight crossing the river. This is one of the wonderful stories of the Civil War because it's different, and that is often something I like seeing is where things aren't what they normally are. Go ahead and talk to me about how the 7th Michigan gets across the river. Sure. Now, the I believe it was the 1st and 50th New York engineers have been trying to lay down a pontoon bridge across the Rappahannock for quite some time throughout the morning of December 11th, and they are going to be unsuccessful in this action, primarily due to Confederate sharpshooters on the opposite side. And even the overwhelming firepower of the Federal Army, particularly from the reserve artillery, will not be able to silence those sharpshooters. So there will be calls for volunteers to actually man the pontoon boats and pull them across the Rappahannock make a bridgehead, and actually begin to clear out those buildings in what is almost, well, a modern-day urban warfare. But the 7th Michigan is one of those regiments that volunteers to go. Baxter is going to gather his men into a number of these pontoon boats, and they do make their way across the Rappahannock. They disengorge from the vessels and begin to clear out these buildings. And there's going to be some really intense street fighting that begins to ripple forth from the actual waterway, the waterfront, I should say, of uh, this part of Fredericksburg. And in the process, Baxter himself is going to be shot through the shoulder. Now, it's is specifically described as shot by miniball through left shoulder. So he will be out of the action fairly quickly once they get across, but between the 7th Michigan, uh, I believe there's a Massachusetts regiment that jumps in on this, and a couple of other regiments, they are able to form a bridgehead. The pontoon bridges are laid, and the rest of the Army of the Potomac begins the crossing. Well, Matt, is this a regular thing in the Civil War for soldiers to jump into boats, or is this something that is fairly unique? It is somewhat unique, but we do have to remember it's not entirely um, unknown. We have seen this before, particularly in the Burnside Expedition in the spring of 62. Uh, we do have some of this on the Carolina coastline, but on an internal waterway, like crossing a river under fire in these pontoon boats, we have not really seen this before. The situation is actually somewhat similar because whereas Burnside had the U.S. Navy and all their big guns firing overhead and trying to suppress Confederate forces, uh, the Federals at Fredericksburg will have Henry Jackson Hunt and the United States Artillery Reserve pounding the snot out of Fredericksburg and trying to suppress those guys. Let me ask you this. You think about early crossings of rivers and that into combat. You think right away about George Washington crossing the Delaware. How does this differ from that? It's extremely different. Where Washington is dealing, he's fighting the weather more than he's fighting anything else. Okay, The Delaware He's moving in a snowstorm. The Delaware is partially frozen. There's big chunks of ice that are threats to his boats, uh, his rafts that are trying to get across. But he is sneaking up onto the 
Hessian garrison at Trenton. They don't really know he's coming. The Confederates are very well aware that the Federals are coming. Is this a culmination for Baxter? Is this the end of service for him when he's wounded? It's not going to be the end of his service. Um, he's going to be returning to duty sometime in early 63, and he was actually going to be promoted in April of 1863 to Brigadier General. Um, he would actually be wounded multiple times throughout the Civil War. His Fredericksburg wound is actually his third wound. He's already been wounded on the peninsula and at Antietam, uh, though his Antietam wound is generally seen as probably a spent ball that struck him, but it was a contusion to the chest it was written up as. He will be wounded a fourth time uh, during the Overland campaign where his horse is killed underneath him. Actually, the uh, shot will pass through his leg and into his horse, killing his horse, and the horse drops on him. But he is actually going to have a, a very interesting post-war life as well. He's going to finish his service in 65. He will apply for a pension in 1866. And then he will be made the Register of Deeds of Hillsdale, Michigan, uh, not long after that. But his service to the United States as a whole would actually come up again in 1869. He would be made, uh, excuse me, he would be made the uh, minister to Honduras. And he is going to spend some time in South America until 1872, where he would return to Michigan at that point. His health is beginning to fail. He's trying to set up a, a lumber company, and then unfortunately he dies shortly thereafter in 1873. He is going to be buried in Somerset View Cemetery in Jonesville, Michigan. What I really like about Baxter is, is that he is one of these non-traditional volunteers. He is a an older gentleman. He's in his late 30s. He doesn't necessarily have to go to war. He has a business. He has uh, prosperity to him. He's got some pretty deep ties to Jonesville, but he chooses to go anyways. He, has he feels responsible for the men of his company, of his militia company, the guys he's convinced to join up and become Company C of the 7th Michigan. And he wants to lead these men and, again, is responsible for them. And I really think that uh, says a lot about the man and the fact that he not only would continue to lead these soldiers throughout the war but and gain high rank for doing so, but he would continue to receive and maintain places of responsibility even after the war. So this is somebody that folks looked up to. This is somebody who earned that respect and trust from others. Well, Matt, I know this is different than we've ever done episodes, whether you and me or us, but thank you so much for bearing with us and being part of it. Thanks for bringing the story and spending some time with us here at Civil War Digital Digest. My pleasure, Will. Always a pleasure to be here. And we'll say to you guys, thank you for spending your time with us. It's a, original stories like this that just make it so much easier to get a connection to history. And a good book like The Faces of Union Soldiers at Fredericksburg helps you do it. Find the book, find the stories, find a connection. We'll see you next time at Civil War Digital Digest.